Senator Kane, we are deeply honored that you have come to speak to us and offer remarks to the graduating class of 2016. Thank you so much. Well, what a beautiful day. And before I start my comments, I just have to say, I can't believe you asked me to give a speech outdoors in Williamsburg. I have horrible luck giving speeches outdoors in Williamsburg. I was inaugurated in Williamsburg. The, the inaugurations of Virginia governors traditionally take place in Richmond because Jefferson moved the capital to Richmond from Williamsburg in 1780. But when I was inaugurated in January of 2006, the Virginia capital was undergoing renovation. So they brought the inauguration back to the colonial capital. And it was a cold and windy and rainy day. During my entire tenure as governor, every time I did an event in Williamsburg that was outdoors, it rained. I was about three years into my four-year term and somebody finally said to me, you know, uh, governor, Anytime you do an outdoor event, the wind where it rains as the wind starts to whip up. <laughs> and, 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 we're, and, and the person said, we start to think of this as kind of Kim Kane weather. And it's, it's funny, I think of it as Williamsburg weather. But it's nice to break the tradition so far and be here with you on such a beautiful day. I'm sure the sun is shining on you because of your great accomplishments. I am honored to be asked to come and share with you today to celebrate this important day with the William and Mary Law School graduates, both JDs and LLM, with faculty members, with family and friends. Of course, this reminds me of my 1983 law school graduation at Harvard, that young upstart law school that opened its doors 38 years after William and Mary commenced legal education in the United States. I remember my graduation day pretty well. It was a whirlwind of family, friends, and fun, all accomplished by a sense of gratitude, exhaustion, relief, and especially accomplishment. You all have not chosen an easy path. And you're going into new challenges ahead, preparing for the bar exam, possibly moving to a new town, starting into legal practice. So with hard work behind you and hard work to come, take this time to fully appreciate what you have accomplished. And your sense of accomplishment shouldn't be limited to your own personal achievement. Seeing the students and hearing what they've done has been pretty impressive sitting here on the stage. And as a class, you've already started to show why law is considered still a profession and not just a job. Yesterday, 72 of the graduates were recognized at an award ceremony for pro bono legal service during your time here at Wayne & Mary. You've led Thanksgiving food basket drives, You've registered bone marrow donors. You've provided more than 17,000 hours of pro bono service through the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. You've established an innovative partnership with the Virginia Institute of Marine Science to better prepare our state for sea level rise. And you've staffed the nationally known, nationally known Polar Clinic that helps veterans, active duty military, and families on the many legal issues they confront. This instinct that you've shown as a class to use your legal training to help others should be the foundation for the rest of your legal careers. You might imagine that with the Supreme Court vacancy and so many other legal issues swirling around, I was tempted to offer remarks today about legal issues confronting our country. But as I sat down to write these comments and think about you, my thoughts kept moving back from the issues of the day to the time when I was just like you, starting out on an exciting, new, and uncertain path to practice law. After a one-year federal judicial clerkship, I took the Virginia bar exam, moved to a new city and a new state, got married, and started my legal career all in the space of four months. I imagine some of you are going to be undergoing those same transitions in short order. It was a time of huge transition. And despite all my undergraduate and legal education, I still had so much to learn, and so do you. Much of your learning will come at the hands of the lawyers and judges that you work with in the starting phase of your legal career. Working with people you care about, 
and people who care about you will be one of the most important factors in whether you enjoy this great profession. And I could do a whole speech about what I learned from lawyers I practiced with during my 18 years of active law practice. But instead, what I want to talk to you about is what I learned from my very first clients. I had hundreds of clients over the course of my career. Individuals, companies, local governments, nonprofit organizations. But you'll never forget your first clients. Those who come to you when you barely hung your law license on your office wall. And I had three very unique clients in my first year as a lawyer who taught me an awful lot. There was Lorraine, my first client. She was a young woman just my age who was referred to our firm by a local housing organization. In the same way that I had just moved to a new city, Richmond, and searched for an apartment to find a job, Lorraine had also come to Richmond to work and look for an apartment. She, she saw a newspaper ad for a place in a neighborhood she liked. She called and found that the apartment was vacant, and she made an appointment to go visit it on her lunch hour. When she showed up to visit the apartment, just 90 minutes later, she was told that the apartment had just been rented. She was sort of stunned. And when she went back to work, she thought maybe the fact that she was African American made the owner change his mind. So she got back to work and asked a Caucasian colleague to call later the same afternoon and ask about the apartment. And her friend was told by the owner that the apartment was still available. I drafted my first lawsuit for Lorraine a federal fair housing action against the owner of the apartment. And with the testimony of her co-worker, this case was a slam dunk win. We settled it shortly after the case was filed. And suddenly, having done one case, I was now the Virginia expert on the fair housing laws. <laughs> that became the heart of my practice until I stepped down from my firm to become lieutenant governor in 2002. But what I remember from representing Lorraine was not so much the law what I remember was that we were so similar, but we were also so different. We were both almost exactly the same age. We were both embarking on the first days of our professional lives. And part of that is finding a place to live in a new city. But her experience was a negative, while mine was a positive. And as I listened to her, I understood a few things in a way that I'd never understood before. First, where you live, your home, is more than a physical thing, it's truly an extension of who you are. And if you're blocked from living where you want to live, it cuts to the very core of your person. And second, Lorraine's clear mistreatment because of her skin color made her anxious about what would happen the next time she looked for an apartment. I've gone through life experiencing many ups and downs, but I've never been burdened with the worry that people will treat me badly because of my skin color. Once you've experienced that, and experienced that in the way Lorraine had, it's hard to escape the memory, and maybe more importantly, it's really hard to shed the worry that it might happen again. I didn't know this as a 26-year-old lawyer, but Lorraine taught me that, and I've never forgotten it. <coughs> a few months later, one of our senior lawyers brought James and Diane into my office. They were a just-married couple. Diane had a mental disability and was living with a distant relative who was also her legal guardian. Diane married James against the guardian's wishes and had come to the firm because her guardian had filed suit to annul the marriage on the ground that she didn't have sufficient mental capacity to get married. And so I represented Diane in a, in a lawsuit in order to preserve her marriage. It's hard to imagine that we would deprive somebody of the joys of marriage because of their mental condition, but that was what Diane's guardian was trying to do. So I fought the case hard. And I was able to get the guardian suit dismissed against, uh, dismissed so that James and Diane could stay together. In the process of the case, I discovered the reason behind the guardian's objection to the marriage. She had been taking Diane's social security disability payment checks for years, and the wedding threatened her monthly income that she had come to depend upon. Ultimately, the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecuted the guardian for taking these funds from Diane. What started off as a domestic marriage case in the Richmond Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court ended up as a criminal trial against the guardian in federal court where I had to testify. I learned a lot from Diane. 
As a newly married guy, I learned a deep lesson about the sanctity of marriage and the foolishness of trying to keep two people apart who were in love. I learned about the awesome responsibility of what it is to have a law license. Whether Diane's marriage survived or not depended upon my work. And I also learned a very critical lesson that has served me well throughout my career as a lawyer and in life. Whatever the issue seems to be at first, you've got to look deeper. The marriage lawsuit ostensibly filed to protect a mentally disabled person was really the guardian's effort to continue the subjugation of Diane and the theft of her disability payments. Again and again in law and in life, the underlying reality is so different than the facial appearance, whether it's about a person or about a case or about a situation. You've got to look deeper, and representing Diane taught me that. My third client, and the last one I'm going to tell you about, is Rick. Rick was an inmate on Virginia's death row. He had been convicted of murder and sentenced to death. He had exhausted all of his direct appeals. He had a volunteer lawyer working on a habeas corpus case for him and a scheduled hearing in the Virginia Supreme Court a few weeks away. And suddenly, without warning or notice to Rick or anyone, the lawyer that was representing him moved to another state. So now he had a Supreme Court argument and no lawyer. And there was a frantic effort to find a new lawyer to volunteer to take the case. Somebody in Richmond knew that I was a lawyer and knew that I was against the death penalty. And so they called to see if I would assume Rick's representation. By this point, I'd had my license, I think, five months. And my quick review of the circumstances told me this case was a complete loser. I was very tempted to beg off on the ground that Rick was a bad person, or I was too new to the bar, or there were no issues in the case that were likely to succeed, or that taking the case might be really unpopular with my colleagues and my firm or others. But I kind of had a nagging feeling in my conscience too. Don't I believe that somebody facing capital punishment is entitled to legal counsel? When no lawyer in Boston would represent the English soldiers who fired on colonists during the Boston Massacre, John Adams stepped forward and volunteered to defend them on the ground that nobody should face death without the benefit of an attorney. If I'm opposed to the death penalty, shouldn't I have some obligation to act on it rather than just kind of state my position? I couldn't suppress those nagging questions even though I really didn't want to take the case, so I agreed to take it. I represented Rick for about two and a half years until he was executed. It was exhausting work, and my initial feeling was correct. There were no legal issues that were ultimately going to get him a new sentencing or a new trial. He committed a horrible crime, and the laws of Virginia, whether I liked him or not, allowed a jury to impose the penalty of death. But I learned so much from working on this hopeless case. One day, about four months before the execution date, when I still had so many pleadings to file and court hearings to go to, but I also knew in my heart that they would be unsuccessful, I just ran into a mental block while sitting at the computer contemplating the next move on the chessboard. The knowledge that we would lose and that I would be sitting with the client on death row as he was prepared for his own execution just stopped me in my tracks, and I just couldn't for days do anything on this case. I had work to do, and it was life or death, but I just couldn't make myself face the reality of it. And as I was in that mood, a beautiful line from scriptures from 2 Corinthians, quote, in my weaknesses, my strength occurred to me, almost as if from out of the blue. I'd heard that verse preached many times before, but I'd never understood it. I never really felt that it applied to me. But as I was sitting there kind of grappling with this paralysis, I now did understand it. And I understood that you can't flee from your weaknesses. You've got to embrace and own them. And that's just a natural part of being human. I was afraid. I was afraid. And that was stopping me from acting. But somehow once I admitted that to myself, it helped me jump back into my work and crank out all the pleadings and stand on my feet in front of state and federal courts right up to the very last day. And this is a lesson that I've come back to again and again throughout my life. Fleeing from your weaknesses or pretending you don't have them makes you weak. 
but acknowledging your weaknesses, which can be very hard to do in one of life's great mysteries, can make you strong. On the day that Rick was executed, I sat with a priest and a friend of his just outside his cell for hours to talk and to share his last meal so he wouldn't be alone. It was a very painful and very surreal experience. Let's face it. Every human being has a natural instinct to avoid pain and painful situations. I didn't really want to be there, but I knew I was supposed to be there. If nothing else, I wanted my client to know that I had done all I could and that I'd never given up. He hadn't experienced that very much from people in his life. Years later, I became mayor of a city with too many homicides and too many violent crimes. And I had to go to crime scenes and funerals and support group meetings of families who had lost loved ones to violence. And then when I was governor, we suffered the worst shooting in the history of the United States when 32 beautiful students and faculty were murdered at Virginia Tech in April of 2007. And I entered into an immediate and intimate and long-lasting set of relationships with the family members whose loved ones had been killed or injured on that horrible day. These were painful experiences. But because of what I learned in representing Rick, that an important part of being fully human is just being able to accompany somebody even in painful and difficult times, I knew what I needed to do in those situations. And I was able to find the strength to do it. And I'm not sure I would have known how to do it had it not been for my client. Now over the course of my 18 years in law practice, there were so many others family businesses fighting to survive, local governments working to solve constituent problems, regular folks who just wanted a fair shake in their dealings with their neighbors or their employers or their elected officials. Of course, most of the cases weren't so dramatic as the three I described, but I learned from everybody along the way, and that's what I want to say to you today. You have entered a profession that will give you a most unique vantage point in understanding people at their best and at their worst, at their times of greatest triumph and at their moments of greatest tragedy. During your careers, most of you will have clients who will place in your hands their most cherished concerns, family, freedom, financial well-being, livelihood, happiness. They will place those most cherished things in their life in your hands. One of your school's great students and great scholars, Justice John Marshall, noted this toward the end of his life, quote, the judicial department comes home in its effect to every man's fireside. It passes on his property, his reputation, his life, his all. That is a tremendous honor. That is a tremendous responsibility. Oftentimes, it is a tremendous burden. But that's what's, what makes the profession of law so very, very special. And so I'll just ask you to remember that it is not just what you can do for your clients. My clients taught me lessons that I still reflect on today, long after I gave up law practice because of the demands of full-time public service. They changed me as a lawyer. They changed me as a person, and they will change you too. Good luck, and Godspeed.